this uh, afternoon really is split into three sections. The first, and we'll go through this relatively quickly, to define and set the benchmark, if you like, for what innovation is, and also why innovation is important. Now, I'm making a, a fairly large assumption here by thinking that because most of you are attending this particular session, you're probably sold on the benefits of innovation, but it helps to think about that together and to work through that. The second part of the presentation will be looking at contrasting the legal mindset against what we would call a stereotypical kind of innovator or innovation type mindset. Again, we'll be talking about stereotypes, so you'll have to forgive me for this. Uh, it's not all an indication about all of you uh, when we talk about the legal mindset, but it'll help illustrate a point. And the last part of the session, and this will really be the focus of the session, is thinking about practical ways in which we can start fostering a legal, uh, an innovative mindset in the legal profession. Where do we start? How can we develop our creativity? And how can we test some of those ideas? And what does that look like? So I wanted to take you through uh, the first part of our presentation, which is what is innovation? Innovation is one of those interesting things, I think, um, because it's often easier to identify. People readily can point to an innovative product, an innovative service, an innovative service delivery that they've received. But when you begin to ask them, but what is your definition? What is your concept? What is the concept of innovation? You often get some fairly divergent responses, often referring back to examples not necessarily defining what innovation actually is. And the challenge with that really is that if you can't define it or if you can't agree what it is, it's very difficult to hit that target. It's very difficult to hit that mark because you haven't got a common idea of what innovation is. Some very good responses there. The one that um, is relatively simple and that, that we've seen in the market and comes from an innovation consultancy called Inventium. I don't take any credit for the, the simplicity and the elegance of this particular definition. is change that adds value. Uh, the beauty of it, as I say, is its simplicity, but also it's highly circumstantial. The value piece, the bit at the end, really does depend on what you're doing. What value is perceived by the client, what value you perceive in developing that particular product or service. Uh, what value is in the circumstances of that particular uh, innovation or innovative way of thinking. So I wanted to keep that in the back of your minds because it's a fairly easy definition to keep in the back of your mind but also to think about that in the context of the remainder of the presentation, particularly the, some of the tips and tricks in developing an innovative mindset and then testing some of those ideas, change that adds value. I promised you I'd, I'd talk to you fairly briefly about the why piece for innovation. We've just talked about kind of the what in what is innovation. But for the why piece, I don't propose to dwell on this for too long. But I think the key benefit of innovation is that first point, the alignment of stakeholder expectations. That's not just a buzzword like you know, synergy and all the rest of it. Innovation, when it is done properly, is rooted in need. In fact, it starts and finishes with need. Uh, and that's the heart of really customer service. So once you begin to identify those needs and you begin to solve for those, then you have a genuine alignment of stakeholder expectations. We're not in the business, and I was saying this to my wife uh, on the weekend, as I was a poor woman, I was testing this out on her. I said to her, we're not in the, bidget, not, not in the business of uh, preparing fidget spinners. You know that craze that came out a couple of years ago and kind of yes. faded away? Yeah, yes, yes, yes and no. Faded. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Kids may have had them. You may have had them, I don't know. Um, but that craze that came in and out, just that spinning kind of disc and all the rest of it, uh, that, that came in and came out relatively quickly, but it didn't fulfill a particular need. It was kind of a cool idea, but as we'll see, particularly towards the end of the presentation, a cool idea isn't enough, and it's actually not a very good place to start when we're thinking about enduring long-lasting, needs-based, needs-focused innovation. So the first point really is the alignment of stakeholder expectations. I'll deal with the next two points together, points of difference and new business opportunities. Uh, there have been a number of um, surveys done of the market, uh, and one of those that's been particularly interesting asked respondents to say whether or not they thought law firms were innovative or innovating. And the interesting result out of that was that 27%, nearly a third of respondents said no. No innovation whatsoever. Not some innovation, not part innovation, none. Uh, that could be for one or a combination of three reasons. One, and this is relatively obvious, law firms aren't innovating. Uh, you can thank me for that later. Two, they are innovating, but they're not selling it particularly well. They're not communicating the value that sits behind that. Uh, or three, and this may be the, the most probable one, the way in which clients or the market thinks about innovation and value is different to the way in which it's actually being prepared. 
And that leads me very neatly, in fact, to the lower costs proposition. Uh, we often uh, associate innovation with lower costs, mainly because of the technological aspect to it. But, and this was an excellent point from before. That's not an exclusive way in which innovation occurs through technology. I think, by the way, as an incidental, incidental point to lowering costs, one of the bits that needs to be worked out when we think about new technology and the adaptation of new technology to the legal market is the apportionment of risk. And I'm talking like a, like a typical lawyer here. But I don't think that's been fully resolved yet in the market. So a new bit of kit, for example, a new bit of software that goes through and data mines information from a, from a data room or as part of a due diligence exercise, for example. Who takes the risk on that? Is that the service provider? Is it the law firm that, that bundles its service with that service provider? Or is it the client? I don't think that's yet to be resolved. I don't propose, by the way, to resolve that for you this morning. But it's one of those considerations that sits hand in hand with the lowering cost proposition. There is a corresponding degree, at least at this stage of the life cycle in those technologies, of risk. What goes with that? What goes with the lowering cost? Who takes the risk? And where should that risk be apportioned? And the last point really is on, on survival. People talk about this a lot, and it's kind of been done to death. And I'll do it to death a little bit more by sharing with you a quote from uh, Langdon Morris, the Innovation Master Plan. I think this, it's a fairly lengthy quote, and I apologize for its, for its length, but because I like the sound of my own voice, I'll just read it out to you and just call out some things that come out of this in particular. He says, the why of innovation is brutally simple. Change is accelerating. If things didn't change, then your company could keep on doing what it's always done, and there'd be no need for innovation. If markets were stable, if customers were predictable, if competitors didn't come up with new products and services, and if technology stayed constant, then we could all just keep going as we did yesterday. But all the evidence shows that change is racing at you faster and faster, which means many new types of vulnerabilities. Technology advances relentlessly, altering the rules of business in all the markets that it touches, which is, of course, every market. Markets are not stable. Customers are completely fickle and competitors are aggressively targeting your share of the pie. So, please ask yourself, are we managing with the realities of change in mind, and are we handling, uh, sorry, and are we handling uh, uncertainty? Keep in mind there what it doesn't say. It doesn't say that innovation is a new thing. Innovation has been happening for a very, very long time. Equally, uh, a similar buzz buzzword in disruption. Disruption has been happening for a very, very long time. The difference, though, today is the first part of the quote, that is, the, the rate of change and the acceleration of that change. So I'd invite you to think about that uh, when you're thinking about how to implement innovation and how to begin selling the innovation story to your particular organizations. While some of us readily accept the why piece for innovation, this is perhaps the easiest and the simplest, and to use the language, the, the most brutally direct point, on the why piece for innovation. It's not new, necessarily, and disruption is not new, but the pace of change is accelerating, and it continues to accelerate, and that's why innovation is actually critically important. I want to take you through the legal mindset and the legal printer. Now, please, before you write in with a series of complaints, presumably to Terry, uh, I am uh, giving you stereotypes here, right? Stereotypes between what is the quote-unquote traditional legal mindset and quote-unquote the, the innovator mindset. I appreciate that all of those characteristics, attributes, etc., may not be uh, exactly applicable to each individual, but I'm trying to illustrate a broader point, which I promise I'll come to eventually. Um, I wanted to introduce you firstly to Sarah Blakely. She is the founder of Spanx. Anyone recognize Sarah or her product? Uh, yeah. Clearly, I'm not wearing any of her product, as you can tell. <laughs> Sorry for those joining in on the webinar and in the room. Uh, in 2012, for Forbes called her the world's youngest self-made billionaire. So it's a B, not an M. Uh, and in 2012, she's been hugely successful. In the first year of her uh, business, she brought in, I think, $4 million of revenue. Second year, $10 million, And it's been exponential since then. So the, the world's youngest self-made billionaire. <coughs> when she's asked about the best bit of advice she's ever received, interestingly, she does not talk about success. She talks about a question that her dad asked her for most of her childhood at the dinner table every week. Can anyone guess what that question was? Just one question, every week, pestered by your dad. Why? Fair question to ask. Why? Any other ideas? Uh, could it be what do you enjoy doing the most? What do you enjoy doing the most? Yep, so appealing to her interests and, and some of her values. 
Could have been that. Great. What did you do differently today? What did you do differently today? Good. I'm liking the, the innovation piece. Interestingly, it was a seven word question. What did you fail at this week? Just absorb that for a second. What did you fail at this week? <laughs> Every week. <laughs> <laughs> Every week, my staff at the dinner table. Uh, here we go again, Dan. She moved out when she was 18. Yeah, yeah, Come on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's why she was so successful. Um, what did you fail at this week? That's one striking aspect of her story. The other striking aspect of her story is that when she'd tell her dad, her dad's immediate reaction was to high five her. Right? And she said that was instrumental to her thinking as an innovator and as an entrepreneur. Why? Because it challenged her and questioned to her what happened when she failed. And she was always affirmed by her father with the high five, uh, even though she had failed, notwithstanding the fact that she had failed. So when she talks about success, she actually goes back to her story about her dad, who asked her on a weekly basis uh, about her failure, and then high fived her when she told him the answer. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute in the context of the legal profession. Right. Most lawyers, and I'm, again, speaking generally, don't talk about failure. It's a shame to talk about failure. It's an embarrassment to talk about failure. Meh, risk, maybe. Maybe we talk about risk and healthy apportionment of risk and all the rest of it. But we do not talk about a failure. We're talking about a profession that values precision, that values consistency, that values precedent, and that values getting it right. Doesn't talk about failure. Just keep that in the back of your mind for a second. I want to introduce you to this article from uh, the Harvard Business Review. It's a little old, but it illustrates my point relatively well, so I'll use it. Uh, I'll read it up to you again. India's iconic Tata Group is a remarkably diversified company with investments as divergent as tea and steel. As the company seeks to grow beyond its Indian roots and compete with the best globally, innovation is becoming increasingly central to its strategy. Toward that end, Chairman, Chairman Ratan Tata has instituted a surprising competition, a prize for the best failed idea. To spark innovation and keep the company from avoiding risks, the prize is intended to communicate how important trying and failing can be. And get this quote, you won't get a lawyer saying this, maybe me quoting him. Failure is a gold mine, proclaims the new retirement chairman, hoping to leave the sprawling company with enough of an innovative spark to keep it relevant on the global stage. Gold mine is a failure. What did you fail at this week? Don't get me wrong. Uh, I was on an innovation program earlier this year in Beijing, and to my absolute shock, we had a, a very successful innovator up on the stage. And he was boasting almost arrogantly about the number of startups that he'd created and the number of startups that he'd failed and the amount of investor money that, he, that he'd wasted. Uh, it was remarkable, you know, the goal of, of that kind of comment. That's not the sort of failure, just to be upfront and clear about it. That's not the sort of failure and risk-taking that we are promoting. What we are thinking, though, and I'll come to this later in the presentation, is a healthy degree of risk and a healthy degree of failure. And what I want to do is challenge, for all of us, really, what our attitude is towards risk and towards failure and how that, that sits in with our traditional thinking uh, as, as lawyers in particular. So I want to take you through a few, again, stereotypical characteristics of the legal mindset, precedent-oriented, conservative risk profile, averse to failure, averse to material risk, and usually, not always, time-based. Now, again, that may not be you, but it, it is a stereotype uh, that is often seen about, about lawyers. I want you to contrast that with some of the concepts that we've just talked about for an innovative mindset. Uh, it is needs-oriented, not precedent-oriented. It is a challenger risk profile, not a conservative risk profile. It is averse to complying with norms, not averse to failure. It's uh, averse to roadblocks, not averse to material risk. And it is output-based, not time. Just wanted us to reflect on that. Because I think w in, even in preparing for this, I was challenging myself on, about my traditional notions of risk and failure. Uh, talking about it, communicating it, empowering people to be able to take it a healthy degree of risk and a healthy degree of failure. But what I wanted to take you through now was some ideas, tips and tricks, some practical stuff on fostering an innovative uh, mindset. I'll cover three parts as part of this. Why, so where to start innovating. Two, how can you, you, can, you, you can develop your creativity. And three, how you can test your ideas. So firstly, where should you start innovating? Consistent with my comments at the beginning of 
the presentation. Please start with a need. Always start with a need and come back to a need. Uh, why? Because starting with a cool idea, which I'm hoping you won't start with, uh, may be cool for you, I don't mean this in a rude way, but may not be cool for somebody else. And if it doesn't satisfy a particular need, and if it's not needs-based, then I don't think it's actually sustainable in the long term. So uh, please start with a need. And one of the things, and this is why I've got my friend here from FlexTape, but you weren't expecting to see that this morning, or this afternoon. Um, infomercials, I think, are a fairly good example of irritating the living daylights out of people, but two, um, linking need with the product. It's bleedingly obvious if you weren't, even if you're walking in and out of your room while a, an infomercial was on, where the need sits and where the solution sits. And I'd encourage you to think like that. I mean, the chap here from FlexiTape, the need is fairly obvious, and the solution is also fairly obvious. If we start thinking about that from an innovation perspective, starting and finishing with the need, then we get that alignment of stakeholder expectations that I talked about at the beginning. But just as importantly, we get sustainable innovation, not fidget spinners, not temporary fads, etc. You might be thinking, that's nice, but how do I, do I then start identifying need? Some needs are fairly obvious, some needs are less so. And a helpful exercise for distilling needs and, and, and trying to understand needs is what we call kind of painstorming, mapping out all of the frustrations that sit with a particular product. And it involves asking some or all of these questions. What are the user's needs? What steps does the user go through? Uh, how long does each step take? Are all of the steps necessary? At what points are any of the user's steps inconsistent with satisfying its needs? The second is once you've actually developed, you know, identified the particular need or worked through the particular frustration, what are some tips that you can kind of work through to develop some solutions? Uh, and I'll take you through three. The first one up here is to question the assumptions that sit behind that particular product or service. And that's a relatively simple exercise of listing the steps, per the previous slide, for example, listing the steps that are relevant to using that product, using that service, and then questioning for each step whether or not, A, it's necessary, and B, whether or not there's an alternative. Another tip that you could use is the impossible tasks. Again, I don't take any credit for this. This is um, by the innovation consultancy Inventium. And effectively what it is, is to try and solve something that is literally impossible to do. Bear with me. Spend five minutes trying to solve for something that is impossible to do. Engage the creative part of your brain, and this is backed by some scientific data. Engage the creative side of your brain and then try and go back to your real life problem and try and solve it. The third tip is, uh, in terms of trying to find solutions to the needs, is to consider existing technology. This is really the low-lying fruit of innovation, where you try and avoid what process block is. That is, that you only think of one application for one particular product, when in fact you could deploy technology in a number of different ways, as an example, to meet needs. And I wanted to give you an example of, of process block. I'd encourage you to um, try and solve for this as we go through, and I'll explain what process block it, uh, it demonstrates. So. It's only about two minutes. Have a listen. A man is at a restaurant. The waiter's like, hey, we have a great sea bass tonight. Shut up, the man says. I would like a juice glass with water, a lemon wedge, and a match. The waiter's like, what? OK, you weirdo. The man pours the water onto the plate. He's like, if you can get this water into this glass without touching or moving this here plate, I will give you a hundred dollar tip. One hundo dollar rooskies. That night, the waiter walked home one hundred dollars richer. How'd he do it? Um. You have to be a, some kind of sorcerer, some kind of magician or god. If my junior high science class taught me anything, I think I might remember how to do something like this. I feel like the lemon is for the water after he drink. he's going to drink the water and he wants lemon for the water. I like 100% have to light this lemon wedge on fire, I think. Fuck you, wedge! <laughs> That's what I feel, right? Yeah, I kind of feel I just can't figure out how to... So I just need to heat the air inside, inside here, so I'm guessing I just need to touch this thing. There's got to be a way. Are you supposed to light the match? Does the fire help? 
feel like it's just the surface tension on the on the water, not from the heat inside. <laughs> Did I get it right? Kind of. This is baloney. <laughs> so what's the right answer? Well, first the waiter put the lemon in the center of the plate. Then he lit the match and stuck it in the lemon. Then he placed the glass upside down over the lemon. As the match's flame used up the oxygen in the glass, it created a vacuum, which sucked in the water where the glass met the plate. So the waiter was able to get the water into the glass without moving the plate. Hey, stop that. So there you go. I think one of the most interesting reactions to me for, from that particular presentation is the use of the lemon wedge. People just didn't really know what to do with that. One lady tried to light it, another person tried to push the water into the glass <laughs> with the wedge. Uh, one person tried to squeeze it. Th that is a, a very good example of process block where we sit there and we look at the lemon and we say actually, the lemon wedge, and we say actually hey, there's only really one use for the lemon wedge and I can't see how it fits into this particular solution. When in fact it was used, as you saw at the end, to prop up the, uh, uh, the match. It's just a very simple illustration, I think, of process block where we look at stuff and we say actually, I don't know that there's multiple uses for this, or I certainly don't know how to, how to deploy it to get to a particular result. So I'd encourage you to think about that. So where have we come to this far? We've talked about starting with a need. We've talked about uh, painstorming to, to, to illustrate and to um, distill some of those needs. We've given you three examples on how you can begin to develop your creativity. And the last step, really, uh, in the time available, is how you can test your idea. Minimum viable products come out of startup land, really. And it's a term that uh, Inventium, which I've quoted twice now already, uses. It's effectively trying to consider what the bare minimum is to demonstrate the value of your product and to test your product. Again, going back to my earlier discussions about managing cost and risk and failure, this is about managing it in a healthy way, managing risk in a healthy way, managing failure in a healthy way. So if I was to give you an example of a product that I'm thinking about, I'd like you to give me uh, ways in which I could develop an MVP or an example of a minimum viable product to test my product. <clears throat> so very simply, I'm creating a, a website and it maps um, costs over f for, a, for a particular legal matter, multiple legal matters, right? Um, what is one way in which I could test whether or not someone would be interested in, in using that to model costs going forward for other matters? What's an example of a minimum viable product that I could use for that? Survey? A survey? Yeah, you could use a survey to test people's ideas. But even just to demonstrate the product, what's the, what's the simple way I could do that? We just do a mock up or like a Wizard of Oz thing where manually behind the scenes you're doing all the work. It looks like it's automated to them and you can test their interest in it. That's, that's an excellent example. So uh, you could do just simply a series of screenshots that you've made up you know, time and cost and a next page that models different matters, etc. That is fairly low on the cost side of the equation, fairly low on the time side of the equation, and you could begin then to test that with your particular clients. A simple mock-up, you don't have to do the architecture that sits behind it at all, even for that um, a PowerPoint or, or something similar and say, this is, this is what it could look like, to begin to test those ideas. And the last uh, way in which you can test your ideas is, is actually just interviewing clients. We see this as a real hesitation with people because they feel awkward in asking clients uh, what they want, uh, which is a bizarre kind of result when you think about it. But open-ended questions and testing some of the assumptions behind why your product think w why you think your product will succeed is actually important. And don't be afraid to ask the straight questions. Would this be something that you'd be willing to pay for? Do you think that this is something that you would be using? If you do use it, how often do you think you'll be using it? Again, to begin to test the assumptions that sit behind why your product or your particular service may be innovative and may be valuable for someone else. That's really, in the time that we've got available, what I wanted to cover. But if you do have any questions, I'm happy to take any questions or comments on any part of the presentation before we wrap up. Yes. Yeah.